Today we're looking at how to buy houses in France. Now when I bought property in France, I found it incredibly complicated and frustrating. We pulled in a couple of experts to help us figure it out along the way. What's the biggest examples of um, what Americans think they want here in France and then are dissatisfied when they realize that it's not what they thought they were going to get? I believe that a lot, a lot of Americans um, make the mistake and that is they have this romantic idea of some, you know, stone cottage in the middle of nowhere. Okay, and that just seems really romantic and lovely. And that is probably the worst thing they could consider actually doing because it means that they're not gonna have good access for travel. It means they might end up in a medical desert. It means that they might have to have a car where if they lived in a city, they wouldn't ever have to drive a car again. And there's maybe no real community so that they're gonna be lonely. And I think that's the number one mistake they make. Well, it all depends on where they live originally. You know, if you live in a house in Missouri uh, of uh, 300 square meters and you end up with a two-bedroom place in Paris, it's always the problem of comparing what you had and comparing what you get. We have to uh, make this uh, mental exercise that uh, here's a different context. So, because I know in America we're used to like huge uh, elevators, like big terraces, penthouses, and here the city is quite small. The buildings are old. I mean, they are charming with really nice fireplaces and Osmanian buildings. But we have to explain them that some of the buildings, they don't have a lift or that the lifts are really small or that if they want like a, a garden, then we have to move from the city center out of outside Paris, for instance. Okay, but I'm going to go back a step, because yeah. first of all, there's no multiple listing service, which is really different for Americans. Mm -hmm. Because with the multiple listing service, one agent has access to all properties at the same time, which makes it very different from this. So just finding a property is insanely difficult because there's more than 5,000 real estate agents in Paris alone. So to find property, you have to go to every agency. You can't go to one agent and have access to everything. They okay. only have their little pocket of properties and that's what they want to sell. They don't want to sell anyone else's. So once you've found the French home of your dreams, there are three major stages to making it your own. First, the offre d'achat, which is the offer. Then the promesse de vente, which is the sales agreement. And then number three is the acte de vente, which is the signing of the deed. Each one of these stages has their own particularities. So we're going to break it down section by section, starting with the offre d'achat. Once a property has been found, then yes, you make an offer mm -hmm. to the seller, which is not unusual, but the French don't negotiate. They don't want to talk about money. So they only build in about 5% negotiation room. That's real important to know. So I bought two years ago. Should I have tried to negotiate the price to be lower or I just kind of thought I want this house, well, I'll give them the asking price. And I was even thinking about going over the asking price until my German wife told me, Daniel. No, 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 you don't. No. Don't go over okay. the over First price. of all, they are morally obligated to accept asking price. Okay. So if you really want the property and there are other people interested in it and you think there's a risk by making a lower offer, then what you really want to do is just offer asking price and then they will accept it. So the offer is in and the seller has accepted. Now we can move on to step two which is doing the due diligence and drafting the sales agreement, known as the promesse de vente. Alors, donc, une fois que l'offre a été faite, que le vendeur euh, a, a accepté cette offre, ce qu'on va faire, c'est qu'on va déjà demander à nos clients s'ils ont un notaire. Si ce n'est pas le cas, on va donc leur proposer le notaire. Et ensuite, le notaire va préparer le projet de promesse. That is the most important document because it really has everything in it. And it takes about a month to pull all the documents together for that one signing mm -hmm. because you as a buyer are not allowed to sign that document until you have every bit of information on that property you could possibly have. You're not going to wait until you see all the documentation before you make an offer. So you need to make the offer, tie up the property, let the notaires who manage the transactions do their thing. Mm -hmm. The notaire is responsible for the transaction and for the title being clear. Okay, if you're working with your own notaire, then your own notaire is protecting you. If the seller has a notaire, the buyer has a notaire, they share their fees. And you should think about things like uh, inheritance, because inheritance law, when you move here, is going to be French inheritance law. And if you don't have a notaire and you haven't made a will, 
it could be very difficult. And a notaire is absolutely essential. And people should remember, and I'm sure that um, Adrian Leeds probably says that, is that you do not have to use the notaire of the person who is selling the property. No, you can only trust your own notaire. They okay. understand the law, they can tell you what the law is, but they will not advise you. So let's say, for example, you want to really look at the way the, the purchase is structured for future inheritance tax issues, for yeah. example. That I would talk to a tax attorney about. Okay. Just to make sure that you're setting the structure up correctly. The notaire can tell you how it works, but he's not really going to provide the same kind of advice. The notaire is going to ask for a 10% deposit held in escrow. Okay. Sometimes they'll ask for 5%, but it doesn't matter if they're only holding 5 because if you default, you're going to default at 10. But what it's interesting, and, and uh, speaking about strategies, you can reduce the notary fees if we make a uh, list of an uh, inventory furniture that will be uh, in the apartment, or let's say all the furniture that cannot be removed, like a kitchen, uh, this has like a cost, and this can make a uh, reduce in, in some way uh, the notary fees. So this is interesting. After signing the sales agreement, you don't sign the deed directly, but you enter into a 10-day cooling off period known as the délai de rétractation. And once they are signing at this stage, uh, the buyer has a delay of 10 days in which he or she can say I'm not buying anymore and uh, there is no risk, there is no penalty fee. So if you are, if you are not buying like uh, finally it's uh, on the 11th day and you decide not to pursue uh, the purchase, then uh, you lose 10%. Once you've made it through the 10-day cooling off period, you've arrived at the final stage of the process. You've secured the loan, and now you're in the notaire's office to sign the deed and receive the keys. This stage is known as the acte de vente. One thing that was a big surprise is how long it took. Okay. You know, um, generally from the time you you sign a first, I think it's like a promesse, is that right, Daniel? So saying, yes, I'm interested in buying this property, to the time that you sign the final papers, because in the meantime, then you have to go get a bank loan. That takes like six months. Was it hard to get your first bank loan when you bought the um, apartment um, in Paris? We had to provide a lot of paperwork. It seems like in Europe, there's a lot more protections in place and like rules in terms of how okay. much of a loan you're allowed to get, who's allowed to get a loan, but the interest rates, although they are high right now, are way lower than in the U.S. So I think the amount of debt that you're allowed to have in, in France is way, way, way lower than in the U.S., for better or for worse. I think overall it's a good thing, but it makes it a longer process, perhaps, to buy things yeah. here. One thing that, that if I was just going to move here and I had never had any experience in Paris before, I would have found a really cool place and then moved to there. But what happens actually is the place that we live is right on, uh, there's three subway lines, line six, line eight, and line 10, right where we live. Okay. And then there's two bus lines. So no matter where in Paris we want to come here, we want to go there, there, no matter where in Paris I want to go, and you're going a lot, uh, and it's really easy because there's three subway lines right where we live. So when you're talking to people about trying to find a place to live, yeah, go find a cool neighborhood, but also find something that has that's at a crossroads that has ways for them to get around. Because that's something that you never would think about. 